All right, guys. I'm with Tim Woosley. Welcome to the show, buddy. Hey, man. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Let's uh, begin with your family. Tell us who's at home, who you love, and who you're showing up for. Yes. Well, I have my beautiful bride, Emily, and I have a 12-year-old daughter named Ruby, and I have two... Well, I have twin boys, Simon and Oliver. They're nine and a half. Mm. And they're that family. That's the reason why I get up in the morning, man. And where are you located? We're located here in Lincoln, Nebraska. Wow. Did you grow up there? I grew up in Nebraska. Yes, I was in Omaha. And so, yeah, I'm a Nebraska guy. I am. Uh, I have to say that some of my favorite people are from Nebraska. I want to, you know, I think about guys in the front row dads group. We got some killer members up there. So well, then I'll re- just take a bow. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, man. <laughs> uh, it's cool how certain areas around the country and, and around the world tend to, I tend to feel that way, whether or not I've just lucked out in meeting those people or that, that area has a specific vibe. Nebraska has been a good one for me. Tell me Sweet. about your childhood growing up, man. What was it like for Tim as a kid? Well, I tell you, it's been a great life. You know, I, I've, as a kid, my, my mom and dad, uh, we lived in uh, Omaha for a while and it was what you'd probably expect. You know, you think of, uh, you buy the, the big green wheel, the green machine, and you ride your huffy bikes with the, uh, the, the, play, the baseball playing cards through the spokes and uh, you, all those things you think of. Uh, but it's, it was a great time. When I was a kid, my dad and my uncle both played guitar. And uh, that was one of my personal highlights as a kid because, you know, you're a kid, you have a bedtime, right? And so my uncle lived in Des Moines, which is about a three-hour drive away from here. And every other weekend or so, it seemed like my dad would say, I'm going to go visit my brother. We'd all take off to Des Moines and I'd get to stay up until they went to bed. So my dad and my uncle both played guitars. So it was great to sit there and stay up and have me and my cousins all jamming out to like Creedence Clearwater Revival and and Sam Cooke and all these cool old songs. And so that is my most vivid memory of my childhood that I look back and I look back now and I, what I'm doing and it obviously affected me in a profound way. Let's talk about that. What are you doing now? What's and we'll speak professionally, right? And if people aren't watching you right now, they're just listening. There's guitars all around you. So let's oh talk yeah, about that. yeah. Well, I uh, I obviously caught the bug for my dad. I I have a, a studio here in Lincoln, Nebraska, where I teach uh, lessons. I have about fifty students that I teach every week, and they range from ages four to seventy. Uh, I also have a stu- I have an online course called Enjoy Playing Guitar, where I basically am looking to help people do that globally, and it's a blast. It's so much fun. I finally found my calling, and I just couldn't be happier. Now, a couple fun questions here. One: What type of music do you love to play? You know that you could just play forever. That lights you up. That soothes your soul. Well, you know what I love to do when I'm that de- that depends on the time I'm with, like uh, if I'm sitting by myself and like for example when I was waiting to to log on with you, I would just pick up a guitar and I would just play like acoustic blues. You know, if you think mm-hmm. of the old style things like uh, like like Sunhouse or Robert J- uh, Robert Johnson or some of that old style mm-hmm. stuff. I like to do an electric. I like to do an acoustic. But that's just kind of where my fingers just naturally go. You know, almost like I hold on, hold on, hold on. Dude, I have it. I'm th- I'm totally putting you on the spot. But are you able to pick it up and just give us like a sampling of what that is? Like, could you drop the mic near the guitar and just give me like 15 sure. seconds? Do you want acoustic or electric? Uh, acoustic. Let's. Acoustic. Yeah. Okay. So this is kind of my my go to uh, my go to meditation, if you will. All right. Okay. So, yeah. All right. That sounds good. You got that? Yeah. Yeah. I got okay. it. Got it. That's so badass. Yeah, thanks. Oh, My I wife will probably sits across the room and rolls her eyes like, yep, he's playing the hits every night. <laughs> Dude, I love that, man. You know, here's an interesting part of my childhood growing up is I, I fell in love with blues when I was 
maybe 14 or 15. And I, I, man, it just resonated with me for, you know, and I, I felt like the outsider. I felt like no other kid my age was, was enjoying. I was listening to Muddy Waters and BB King. And Mm. uh, I know I I found Clapton and I found, I think it was Johnny Lang and all Mm -hmm. these. Right. But I I remember going to see BB King in concert at Wolfgang in Maryland. Um, and I think, you know, I was thinking, I don't know how many other 15 or 16 year olds are in love with blues, but it hit me in, in my heart. So I, man, I hear that. And I was just, I don't know if you saw me, but I just closed my eyes and I was just soaking that in. Dude, that was beautiful, great. beautiful, man. It, it, there's something about the blues, it, 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 especially in today's, in today's music. And I don't want to offend anybody, but there's something about the blues that just feels so organic and authentic. And it's just it like, it's, it's a laser beam right to your heart. It just pulls on all the heartstrings. You know, I think about dad ideas, things we can do for our family. And one of them that comes to mind right away when you say, when you're talking about that is exposing them to different forms of music, maybe researching those forms of music or reading about those forms of music. Like where did blues develop, right? And how does it make you feel? And what do you think about this music? Like, and that's such a great one too, because when you're in the car, you can always do this. In fact, for my birth, you'll love this, Tim, as a music guy, you'll love this. Last year when we were on our road trip, it was my son's 12th birthday. And I said, dude, here's what we're going to do. I'm going to go find what the top 10 hits were when I was 12 years old. And we're going to play all those songs. And I'm going to tell you where I was, what was going on, what I remember. And so, dude, he was cracking up because some of these songs I'm like singing, you know, with it's like at the top of my lungs and I'm like (laughs) grabbing his arm and his shoulders and his neck. And I'm like, you know, I'm, you know, I'm I'm just belting it out. He's kind of cracking up. I Is think, he rolling his eyes like, yeah, yeah, it, no, it, it, yeah, he was loving it, man. He was doing a little <laughs> bit of eye rolling, but he was also That's loving awesome. it. Like when I act like a fool sometimes and you know that, but I think music has, uh, has a lot to create conversation around music can create a lot of conversation and the, the tiger's studying guitar right now too. And I'm just so happy that he gets to learn something where I see him pick up a guitar, play some music and people sit around him. And I think that, you know, it just brings community together. How has guitar impacted your life or your family's life? Take us into some of the guitar stories because I've seen pictures of you and your family playing. Yeah, it's a great time. Uh, I tell you that on, well, every Saturday night, my wife and I are not available because that's that's where we get together and we just jam. We'll do the same thing you did. Like uh, last weekend, I think we pulled up a Spotify and we looked up like 1994, I think was when her brother graduated or something. And so we just looked through that and like, oh, let's try this one. Oh, is that a Michael Bolton tune? Ugh. Oh, how about this one? This isn't, you know, you'll find these songs and we'll just pull mm-hmm. them up on the charts and we'll just sit there and we'll just laugh all night long until one or two in the morning. Uh, so we do that together as a, as a team. And then we also, I have the studio here, so I have a great excuse to have concerts twice a year where I get the band, that I get the band, the band is my kids, you know. I always thought it'd be really great to, to have kids and then I'm going to put you on bass, I'm going to put you on drums and that's what's happened. Everybody's kind of found their instrument. And so on Sunday, May 1st, we're going to be rocking outside at the outdoor arena. We're going to be playing uh, uh, Get Back by the Beatles and it's going to be great. Ah, that's awesome, man. Do you guys, I, I imagine just now you and your family sitting around watching like School of Rock. Do you have a favorite guitar movie or documentary? Well, you know, there's there's so many. Uh, the one that was the most impactful on me was in the mid 80s, I was working at a video store in Columbus, Nebraska. And I came across uh, Chuck Berry's Hail, Hail Rock and Roll. Now to me, that had such an impact on me because I liked Chuck Berry, but I knew that Keith Richards from the Rolling Stones was in it because I wanted to see him and I, and I was a huge Eric Clapton fan. So I wanted to see him in it and Robert Cray was in it. And so all these stars were in it. Etta James was in it. And I'm like, I got to see this video. And it blew my mind because it just turned me into a super fan of all of these artists. And it was just a great gateway drug for me into like deeper into the blues, deeper, like learning more about Eric Clapton. Who does he like? And then you'd read a little bit about him. And next thing mm. you know, his his fan, he, he's a fan of you know, Freddie King. And who's a, Freddie King's a fan of Muddy Waters. And next thing you know, you're in the Delta in 1920, listening to all these old tunes. And so that was the big one for me was Hail, Hail Rock and Roll. Mm. How else do you use guitar to connect with your kids? Oh, you know, the great thing about the guitar and, and just musicians in general, the instruments and stuff is, it's a great 
In today's society, where we have the fast food, instant coffee, sound bite, quick Twitter culture, everything's quick. It's nice because it's something they can work on and develop over the long run. And what that does is if I sit down with my kids and try to teach them something and they struggle with it, we don't say we fail. We just, we're failing forward. There's no failing. It's really just a learning experience. And so I think that the child that, or anybody who I'm referring to children, but the child that practices and learns how to play an instrument at age seven has now understood how to do the discipline. You won't have to teach him, tell him to do his homework when he's 12 because he understands there's a process and a development Mm. of that. So I love that it's kind of for the long haul. They develop left and right brain things. It's one of the few things we do with our left side and our right side of our brains in terms of the creativity and the analytics and all that stuff like that. It's just such a great way. And you know, it's like anybody else listening, that music connects everybody. You know, maybe not everybody's into baseball. Maybe not everybody's into opera. Maybe everybody's not into, but I mean, in terms of something, everybody enjoys music, right? Mm. So yeah. it's a great connector. Something about pulling that guitar out in the backyard and all of a sudden they're coming in from the, the edges of the wild and coming in and listening and going, let me get mine. And they'll having fun and they're strumming along. So it just connects everybody. Of your 50 students, how many are kids and how many, you said all the way up to 70, but is it mostly kids? I would say probably two thirds are kids, but I have, I have, I would say maybe 10 or so guys and gals that are adults. And when I refer to adults, it's anybody paying for their own lessons, you know, mm-hmm. someone who's taken their own uh, lessons in their heart. And so it's great to see moms and dads and grandpas come in and, and I have a guy who's learning how to play the banjo and he's learning how to play the mandolin and he's, he's just bringing in instruments. So how about the ukulele? Yeah, let's learn that. So it's an exciting thing to see people, older people get into it as something yeah. they wanted to do when they were younger, but never did. Do you have any parents take lessons with their kids? I do have some of those that happen where, uh, in fact, I have a student, she wanted to get her son in guitar and he wasn't really into it. You could tell he just wasn't into it. And I think she, so she eventually took over the lesson Well, she would like sit in for a little while and the little guy's like, I'm done. And so <laughs> I'm teaching her now, but I do have sessions where I think once a year, what I have is I ask the parents of students that are here at the school. I say, here, we're going to do, we're going to do a six week course. Everybody gets a free lesson for the next six weeks where they can come in and learn and play with their kids because it's such an important part of connecting with them. Mm, That's cool. Yeah. Yeah, that's really great. And how have you seen kids develop in their guitar playing abilities? And I'm, I'm asking because I'm curious about what can be extracted from guitar and taken into real life, right? It's how do you talk to them, the tone, the tempo, the encouragement? Have you seen a pattern? Have you seen an evolution, something that we can extract? Yeah, absolutely. You know, uh, well, we have, the, I mentioned, I, I have I host two concerts a year. And that is the main reason I do that is to help Uh, people, not just kids, but people overcome their fear of public speaking because it's going to happen in your life somewhere. You're going to be, you know, you're going to be the vice president of sales and you're going to have to talk to your staff about your quarterly financials or whatever it is. And so two months out of the year, we spend prepping for that. And I think that really does help develop them into more confident people. It's a lot of times they're scared because of it's the unknown. Uh, So I think when we have people going over things over and over again, they, they get kind of a confidence. And it's, it's exciting to see a, a character develop within someone. I had a student several years ago who had uh, Asperger's, and I was teaching him, and we had the concert. Uh, everybody sits uh, in, the, in the audience, and it was his turn to play. So he climbs up, and he starts trying to play his song, and he's not quite hitting the mark. And so... He stands up and he goes and sits back in the audience. And we're thinking, oh man, that stinks. Because we've all been there where we're like, we're bombing and it's just hard. And so I asked him, I said, are you done? And his mom kind of says, you can go again. And so he got back up. He was, you could tell he was just furious. He's like, Mm. I'm not going to let this beat me. So he got back up, played the piece perfectly. And the place went bananas. Like just, (laughs) you know, and then the next performer was an older guy. And I was so glad this older guy came up because, Hey, he says, I just want to stop for a second and say, what you did was awesome. You could have bailed out and none of us were all learning. 
none of us would have faulted you for that, but you stood up and you did it again. And so he just said, I want to just, I want to, I want to praise you for that. That was really inspiring. Mm. And so it's moments like that. that like, Oh, I love my job. I love my life. <laughs> yeah, man. That's great. Speaking of loving your life, where, where are you winning in fatherhood in general? Where do you feel like, man, you know, I'm so happy with the progress I've made here. I consider this a big win. You know, what are the bright spots of being a dad in your life right now? Wow. I, well, the fact that I can spend most of my time with my kids is awesome because right now this is that moment in, in my life, the season of my life where everything is perfect in terms of, you know, as a dad... I think we can all relate that, you know, the baby years are kind of hard. You know, you can't have a conversation with them. You know, there's a lot of there's a lot of drama with crying and changing diapers. But now they're all at this age where they can have conversations, you can build into their lives, and you can see things moving. I my my son, my youngest, or my my son Simon, he's at that moment right now. He's in that he just worships daddy thing. And so he's just always looking at me and his eyes are just glowing. And I'm like, man, I don't want to screw this up. I want to make sure uh -huh. that I'm getting it right because I love this dude. And it's really weird to have a little guy look at you up to you, that, that kind of awe. And it's like, I used to look like that to my dad when I was a kid. So it's like, I really want to make sure that I'm intentional at this time. Mm. Where do you feel that you're missing the mark? What are you working on? Where do you feel you might have a blind spot? Oh, everywhere. It's as a guy who owns a couple of businesses, the, the, the fear I have is that I'm spending too much time at work. And I'm sure you can relate that whenever you're at work, your heart wants to be home. Whenever you're at home, you're like, I should be getting more done at work. So it's just trying to balance that in a way we're not feeling guilty in either place going, I'm here. I'm going to yep. devote my time for that. That's a tough one for me because mm. <laughs> you're always torn. You really, it's tough because to, I feel like I can't win sometimes. You know, I can't separate. Like right now I'm having this great conversation with you and mm. I'm like, I love this conversation, but I can't wait to get home because right after this, I'm going to hang out with my kids. And so a part of me is not even here. <laughs> exactly right. Yeah. Let's talk about that for a moment. This is a question that I think so many of our listeners will struggle with on the regular, which is loving your work, loving your kids and feeling divided. When you're at home with your kids, you're like, oh, I have some stuff I need to do at work. When you're at work, you're like, I really want to get home to the kids or maybe I'm working too much or I'm taking time in the evenings or weekends or whatever it might be, which I think a lot of people have, have done. Talk to us about how you mix, integrate, or perhaps balance all the all that. Well, I don't know how you are with the Enneagram styles, but I I've, just, I've just learned about this in the last couple of, of months, and it blew my mind. And so uh, I'm one of those that is a little bit that tends to be following rules. And so I have decided as part of my thing is it's important for me to basically drop what I'm doing and not not fill in all the dots and, you know, and just break some of the rules and just engage in some quality family time. Because What number are you? I think I'm a seven. Seven. Yeah. The enthusiast. I'm yes. a seven too. Yes. And so it's tough because I feel like I have so many things I have to get done. And I feel like my family tends to get the leftovers because you've got clients, and things like that, that need your attention. And so it's good for me occasionally go, you know what? Not today, not today, or at least not this morning. I, you know, uh, but being intentional about that has been a huge thing for me in the last couple of months of just going, no, I'm just going to stop because <laughs> I'm not going to be on my death, but I should have worked a little harder. Yeah, no doubt. How does your wife feel about your role right now as dad, as husband? If she were here speaking to us, what would she say? Well, she's, she's amazing. I mean, I don't know. I don't know anybody else that could do this life with me, but her, she is, she's my North star. She is She's my superhero, and, and, and I'm sure she would blush when she would hear that. But I think she she knows how hard that I try. She knows, as an enthusiast, she knows how passionate I am about things in life. She knows that I'm willing to drop it all for those guys. And uh, I mean, I don't think she'd have any complaints that I would know about, but I would love to hear her, <laughs> her side mm. of the story. <laughs> What do you feel between the two of you is like your family brand, your culture, your, your vibe, and maybe you've defined your values and you could just share them with us. Or if not, what do you think your family or others would notice are your family values? Well, every week we have a, a weekly family meeting and a weekly uh, marital meeting. And so we've been working on this the past several months about trying to establish some culture. One thing that we like to say is the Woosleys, we do hard things, right? Right. Because I have 
my wife homeschools and she's helping kids with math and they get super distracted and she's, mommy this is hard she goes well yeah buddy Woosley's, we, we do hard things yeah we do hard things and then he gets back into it so it's a great it's a great uh motto for us at this season of life is that we do hard things and they see me struggling with things and i go guys this is really hard but you know what we can do hard things so that's that's kind of our family motto right now but our our theme is probably playful we don't take ourselves too seriously and we really just focus on having a good time and, and being present in the moment with our family what we're doing it's great I want to talk about both these. I want to talk about being playful and I mm -hmm. want to talk about being present. So let's explore both. How do you stay playful? What does playful look like in your home? Well, we don't really have a lot of, uh, like upstairs is our main area in our house. We don't have a TV up there. So it's about, that's more about being intentional and like having the, my wife had the TV on as, as a kid and she decided, no, we don't need that. It's just a distraction. And I was totally on board with that. Uh, so instead we have, uh, we have a record player. And I bought, you know, I bought a handful of blues and jazz records so my kids could experience music. And so it's doing things like that. It, it's being intentional with like, okay, guys, I'm going to put on this Dave Brubeck timeout record. And I want you to listen to it because on every song, they're counting differently. This particular song's in five, four times. So instead of counting one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, it's one, two, three, four, five. So it's just trying to find those little moments like that is an example of just being present it was really exciting. Recently, uh, I bought uh, Miles Davis's famous record that made him kind of blue. That kind of that was like the most selling jazz. I put it on, and my kids don't really play piano. But my one of my sons opened the piano, and he would listen to I think it's Blue and Green, and he would listen to that and he'd hear the dun 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 dun, 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 dun and he would try to find the notes. Mm -hmm. And so it's little moments like that where it makes you think they're paying attention, they're listening, and they're involved in their own adventure. Yeah. Yeah. Any ways that you remain playful with your wife, like things that you guys do to, I mean, you, Saturday night was a perfect Saturday example night, yep. of that. Yeah. 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 We try to find things to do that. Uh, well, recently, like just last night, I, I purchased, uh, I purchased some tickets to see uh, Sebastian Maniscalco in Omaha, which is about a 45 minute drive away. And that's one of our favorite communities because he's so animated, mm. animated. So it's, it's surprising her with little things like that. Say, Hey, check your calendar inbox. Mm. And then she texts me back, what, you know? And so it's little things like that, trying to surprise each other with a little bit of, I think you're going to like this. That's my passion is chasing after my wife with the same intensity and veracity as I did the day I saw. <laughs> what was that day? Tell me your love story. Oh, August 1st, 1998. I was at uh, my best friend's wedding. I was in I was in the long lineup of dudes that matched the bridesmaids. You know, he needed the other side to cover yeah, that. Yeah. So the reception, and I had gone, I had been single for a while and I was still nursing this broken heart. And that day I told my friend, I go, you know what? All bets are off. I'm hitting on everybody tonight. He's like, what? I go, yeah, I'm here. I'll hit on, I'll hit on your sister, your mom. I'm just going to have a good time. I just wanted to like release myself of all that anxiety. Uh, and so I did, I just let go and I danced like a fool around. And then her parents were the uh, DJs. And so crazily enough, her mom was there and she called my wife who was at home. She's like, why don't you come over here? There's a couple of guys I think you might like. Which, no way. Is that banana sandwich or what? Like I got the approval before. <laughs> no and, way. And so she came over and I looked across the room. And if you've ever seen that movie, uh, Wayne's World, where all of a sudden he's the, you know, he sees the girl and is, oh, dream weave. <laughs> yeah. And I was like, oh my gosh, that's the most beautiful girl I've ever seen in my entire life. And instantly I said in my mind, she has a thousand suitors. They're all, she spends her time going, no, thank you. No, thank you. No, thank you. Thank you. But no, thank you. And so I'm like, I'm just going to be part of the litter. I don't care. I have to ask this girl. I asked her to dance. And this was when the, the swing craze was going busy with a uh, zoot suit riot. Right. So yeah, I, was, yeah. I don't know how to swing dance. I was just throwing her around like dish towels, just like, you know, <laughs> and so we both had a great time and we had an amazing time. She walked up to her mom after that. And I didn't know this until she told me much, much later, but she walked up to her mom and she goes, mom, I'm going to marry that guy. No way. And I just, I had that dance. I had that dance. I'm like, that just sealed the deal. I'm like, that, that's what I want to be with the rest of my life. I want to be with her. And so I asked her for her phone number and we went out like a week or so later for like a 
eight hour date because neither one of us wanted it to end. And it's just been a fairy tale ever since. Gentlemen, I want to take a minute to talk with you about The Brotherhood, a group of men that I have the privilege of connecting with every day. These are the men that help me stay focused on being a family man with a business, not a businessman that happens to have a family. And throughout the year, we have deep conversations, real conversations, and share the best resources around six areas of life. Thriving marriages, intentional parenting, vibrant health, emotional intelligence, business evolution, and wealth and legacy. Here's what one of our members has to say about their experience. I want to recognize everyone that really made the commitment and the decision and gave themselves the permission to fully show up and just share. I think all the speakers obviously were awesome, amazing content, but I think the really, the real magic comes from everyone else speaking their minds and sharing what they're feeling, what's connecting and resonating with them. And I think it's a little comments that you might not realize that you say that's going to stick with someone else and really make a lasting impression. Look, guys, the time is now to pour into your family. I read an article by Tim Urban that rocked me to put everything into perspective. He said that 93% of the time that he, as a child, would ever spend with his mom and dad, by his calculations, happened before the age of 18. 93% of the time he'd ever spend with mom and dad happened before the age of 18. I feel confident that saying that no matter how old your kids are right now, the time is to go all in on your family. You know, in the Brotherhood, we have members with kids that are newborns, and we have guys whose kids are grown adults. It's never too late to be a great parent and the journey never ends. No matter how great you are at fatherhood, and you might be the best out there maybe, or marriage or juggling work and family life, this community can help you be better. If you're ready to take the next step, go to frontroadads.com and click join the brotherhood. That's a great story. I have this vision when you're telling the story. So you're like her her mom is there DJing, right? This is what you said. Her mom's DJing. Yeah. And then you're mom and dad the are DJing. About, you're gonna hit on everybody. I had this vision of her mom calling her saying, Look, this guy Tim was hitting on me. And although he's way too young for me, I think you might enjoy him. <laughs> that's really funny. Uh, oh, that's what great. a beautiful story, Tim. That's yeah. really cool, man. I, I love it when it uh when the stars align like that. That's, yes. That's really great. And your your love was born in the realm of music. And I think that's also very fitting. I never thought great. about that. Yeah, that's cool, man. Okay, cool. Let's talk about being present. How do you remain present, right? When you're with your kids, how are you not thinking about work? When you're with your wife, how are you not wrapped up in tasks or activities or whatever else? But how do you stay in the moment? Well, that's, I think that's always a challenge, but I, I think it's something that's intentional. Like every day I get up and I, I read over the things that I think I need to do. And there's a section where it says, if you had to do this day over differently, what would you do? And almost always I type in there, I want to be present with my kids and my family. And so I think it's just doing that day after day after day, just, just like a muscle. You want to work that muscle and, and get it so that that when you're there, you're like, this is the moment. Relax. This is the moment. If those thoughts come in, I'm like, that can handle later. I can handle that later. Uh, but I think it's just intentionality is the big key for that. I can handle that later. That's a great phrase. Yeah. So that's how you course correct when you're in the moment and you're right. starting to drift off. I can handle that later. Mm -hmm. And then setting your intention to be that way regularly. Right? That would be good. Right. And, and it doesn't happen all the time. I mean, I blow it as much as I succeed. Uh, but I think it's the intentionality that the reason I get up and do all this stuff is for them. And knowing that this, whatever the business part, that can always wait. You know, I'm yeah. always taken care of. I can always do a little more. I can always lay off a little bit more. So it's, it's, it's a constant balance. Do you get frustrated? Yeah. Nope. I never get frustrated. <laughs> <laughs> Awesome. No, no, I'm just kidding. Of course I get frustrated. Yes. How does that show up for o you? Only days ending in Y, right? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> uh, Wait. how does that show up? Being yeah. frustrated? Yeah. What what um, frustrates you? How does it manifest? Well, usually uh the way like I'll give you a good example. We just recently came back from a week RV to your lovely state of Texas, where uh we rented a huge 30-foot RV and we went down to uh a Galveston to go onto the beach. The kids were loving it, and uh, we wanted to go to see Dealey Plaza. And so I was listening to the Google Maps tell me where to go, and it was very, very tight. And 
I don't know what it is about the guys in Texas, the way they drive. They they want to see you burn on the side of the road. I, I'm sure they're lovely people, but driving this huge tank downtown Dallas, I finally just went, I erupted. <gasps> And I was just like, I think of like a firecracker. It was like this huge explosion as I'm behind the wheel, just like I have Tourette's or something, and just going crazy. And <laughs> finally having to pull over and go, guys, I'm really sorry about that. It was just, you know, like the 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 culmination of what happens is problem after problem after problem. And you're 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 pushing it down and stuffing it down. And it's kind of like then you shake the soda bottle and then open it up. And next thing you know, it's everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> so I I don't always handle it well. <laughs> yeah. But I'm okay. sure there are a lot of folks that can relate to that. Oh, man. These are absolutely. rare occurrences, but occasionally it does happen. I told the story yesterday on a podcast. I was a guest on somebody else's show and I had said, yeah, last year when I did this road trip with my family and we were on our way back, Tatiana was really sick. She had a 102 fever for like nine days. I have like all these things going on. Like one of my family members got a terminal diagnosis. Another member got a life-threatening diagnosis. Like I had all these things that were stacking up and my wife was sick and our dog was sick. I couldn't believe all the things that were like happening all wow. at once. And I'm driving home and my kids will, are, will not get along in the back of the car. Like they're poking at each other. They're whining, they're complaining They're And I turned around and I yelled at the top of my lungs I, if I tried to yell any louder, I couldn't. Like it was as loud as I could yell. I yeah. broke, literally broke as a man in that moment. It felt like I just completely lost it. Like mm -hmm. I sometimes have some filter, like I might raise my voice. This was as right. big as I could get. There, there was no bigger explosion in my right. life with my kids. And my son referenced it like months, months later about how scary that moment was for him. I think a lot of us have faced that. I think a lot of us have in different ways and it might not be the same for everybody, but sure. You know, yeah. I remember being really scared when my dad lost it and I, I did blame him a lot. And I was, you know, I, I kind of pointed the finger and I was, ang I was angry at him for being angry at me. And now I have so much compassion for my dad because I just am, you know, he always said, when you grow up, I think you'll understand more. And he, yeah, of course, of yeah. course. Yeah. I, I find myself apologizing to my parents regularly. Like, I'm sorry. I had no idea. I was, like this, you know, because yeah. you're young. You yeah, 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 totally. <laughs> what do you think was um, one of the more traumatic things that you've dealt with in your life, Tim? One of the more traumatic things, I, you know, I don't think I would have ever admitted this up until I don't even maybe never, but like I think my parents divorced when I was a teenager, and my dad had left, and and I live in Nebraska, and he met someone, and he moved to New Hampshire. And I didn't see him again. And I thought our family was close in terms of other family members, cousins. They, they thought they were all shocked. Like your guys was, we thought, was the most solid crew out of the entire Woosley family. We would have never bet that this one would have broken. And so just realizing that when my dad left, I was the oldest of three. And in my mind, it was like childhood is over. I switched off and I'm like, it's time to be responsible. You're the you're the adult here now. And so I feel like that was pretty traumatic. And I and I think I missed out on a little bit of childhood because of my decision to take that so seriously. Like it's not your fault. But I think that was probably my most traumatic thing, which is something that stuck with me for a long time now. Yeah. How do you think that shaped you or how do you think that you know altered your blueprint or your behaviors? Well, I think all of my brothers, they're all married and they're been married now for 20 plus years. But I think that was one thing that happened to us was we, we were we were pointing our finger going, we don't want that to ever happen to our family. And so in that case, I like to think that what I did is I doubled down on my commitments. And I thank God every day that I have my wife. And I know that she is, you know, she was sent to me as proof that there's a loving God. Because when I was at my worst point where I was by myself drinking heavily, I was laying there on the floor of my studio apartment, I remember calling out like, man, if you're out there and I'm not just talking to myself, this is what I need. I need a running mate. I need someone that will run with me, that will be joyful. And, be and I gave him a laundry list of all these things that I needed in my life. It was a selfish moment, but I was, I was broken. And I think he took that list down. He goes, that's a pretty good list. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put a couple more down there. I'm going to have her be fierce and I'm going to have her be loyal and I'm going to have her be independent. Mm -hmm. and, I'm, you know, and he added some of those and he's like, but you're not ready. She's not ready. So I'm going to introduce you guys a little bit later. And so when I met her, I was like, well, game over, man. I know that <laughs> there's a God, a loving God out there because this happened for me. And so 
I think that tra- that trauma of my dad leaving helped solidify myself as the man, the father, the husband that I want, that I need, that I strive to be every day. Mm. Man, that, that's touching, brother. That's a great story. I'm so glad that you just shared that. Yeah. It's really great. Okay. Fast forward a little bit, Tim, to the end you know, as far as you can see out, right? You're at the end of your life, you're looking back and what are you most proud of as a family man, right? What do you hope occurs in your life? What does success look like? That's a great question because I think about that literally every day. I I have a eulogy that I read to myself every day. You know, it's like, I tell it that I'll be to hear lies. It's like in your phone, you have something that you read in your phone? Well, I have it. Well, it's on my, it's on my laptop that I type into every day and I make little adjustments about... Oh, yeah how I want to live. Tim was a devoted father and husband. He lived- Wait a minute, do you have it? Can you read it to us? Is it personal? Uh, no, no, let me- if you I mean, of me. course it's personal, but meaning, <laughs> tell me to- No, yeah, let me give it. No, no, no. <laughs> here, let me pull it up for you here. I'll pull up my eulogy. Okay, so obviously this is a work daily in progress. Okay, Tim Woosley lived a heartfelt adventure for 90 years. So that means I have 41 years left. He had a deep faith that life and his role within life were meaningful and meant to be enjoyed. He loved life and loved encouraging others to embrace their inner rock star. So that's the top. The first story is my family. Tim loved his wife, Emily, their daughter, Ruby, and their sons, Simon and Oliver, and was committed to the security and well-being. He considered the love story he lived with his family to be the most important story of his life. Together, they built Paradise Falls, a family home and retreat named after... Uh, that's the name. I haven't got the name figured out yet. Something that matters to us. Paradise Falls housed events for artists and leaders who are the Woosleys believe should be heard and celebrated. At Paradise Falls, friends and family gathered to enjoy conversations that were restorative and inspirational. Tim wrote many books, including You Are a Rock Star, that helped people embrace all they could be. His work helping people unleash their inner rock star helped him grow his company, Enjoy Playing Guitar, which helped, which quickly became a trusted platform for beginner guitarists. Tim taught regularly at his estate and toured around the U.S. to kids' schools, music venues, bringing incredible value to those who attended. To those closest to Tim, he is remembered as a faithful husband, father, and friend who lived with kindness, courage, and faith. To his family, Tim worked hard to provide love, security, and example to follow. Badass, dude. (laughs) So I read that every day. I read that every day. Well, not every day. I, I probably read it 40 times or so, but uh, I would say six out of the seven days of the week, I read that every single day to make sure I'm doing the right thing because you want to reverse engineer your life, right? Most of those things haven't even happened yet. Mm. But it keeps me on the path of where I want to know. It, it keeps me on the story that I want to have as the hero of my own life. It's great, dude. I just wanted to give <laughs> space for that to settle, man. Yeah. I used to, when I was younger, I used to have to feel like I always had to have the right response or a quick response. And now I'm just practicing, like letting that sit for a moment. Yeah. Badass. Yeah. Well, I'm really grateful that you read that. Yeah, it's different to talk about your eulogy than it is to read it. Just yeah. like it was to hear you play uh, guitar, you know, yeah. earlier. Hey, uh, speaking of playing guitar, do you know, when you think about, do you, do you write your own songs or play I mostly do. covers? I do. I do. I find that writing, I don't write as much as I used to because I have a lot of these other ambitious plans, but I do. I find that uh, writing is very therapeutic. I know, I notice that I tend to write more like when someone close to me passes away. Mm. I find that uh, what I end up doing is if, if they pass away on a Monday, I, I go off to a corner and retreat and, and try to process what happened, their life and my life and relationship to them. And a lot of times I end up playing the song at their funeral. And it's mm. just a great therapeutic way because that my, my words and songs and music help heal as other people are maybe not able to express a way of their grief. And so that's something I've noticed, but I do, I have a, I have a band with a friend of mine that were in the garage and we were, we were getting started. Things were going great. COVID came and kicked us all in the shorts and, uh, you know, uh, so we're slowly rebuilding, but yeah, it's great. I love collaborating in any way. So I'm not always the guy, I always tend to be the guy that likes to be off to the side. I don't want to have the mic and be on the spotlight. I want to, I want to be the guy in the corner harmonizing and doing the leads and the fills and stuff like that. Wow. I love what you said about a lot of times with music, it's, I think people resonate with it so much because they're like, that's how I felt. I couldn't express it, but you did it through the notes and the tune and the tempo and the lyrics, mm-hmm. but I wasn't able to get that out. 
It's like yeah. why I think I, when I see a quote that I'm like, yes, I've been trying <laughs> to say that in a thousand words and you just said it in 10. Yes. Right. So thank you for putting all that together. Yeah. I love that. When you think about songs you've played for your kids, is there one song that you think you've played more than others to your children that when they get to the end there, you know, when they grow up, they'll be like, oh man, that's the dad. That's the song my dad played the most. Well, that's funny you should say that because when they were very young, I wrote two songs for them based off of, well, um, well I wrote something off of the, uh, the, the scripture, you know, may the Lord bless you and keep you, may his face shine upon you. I wrote music and lyrics for that. And then uh, I think it's Brahms Lullaby. I would play the Brahms Lullaby and together as a family, we would write these lyrics. And so the lyrics would be like, little man, little man, got a little man named Simon. I'm singing to Simon or Oliver. He's my baby, baby boy, and he brings me so much joy. And so we sing that. Every, like even now, we sing it every night. And so those are going to be the two songs I think that will resonate with. Do you them. play guitar when you do that? I sure do every single night. Would you give us a sample of what that sounds like, man? Sure. Which I, one do you? Which one dude, do you want? I, I love that we've turned this into a concert, man. <laughs> I think I think you should do this on every podcast, man. You pull, should play pull music. Out the jar, right? Okay, yeah, so, that's it. Yeah, give us a okay. sample of what that sounds like. Okay, so the first one uh, is the scripture one. So let's see. And then they'll sing the song as I play it. So let's see. I, um, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May his face shine upon you. May he look upon you and give you peace. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May his face shine upon you. May he look Dude, that's awesome, man. Oh, you <laughs> you, you can tell I'm a guitar player, that. not a singer. <laughs> hey, no, that's it. But dude, I, I actually, I think that's really great. Yeah, I think what you just did is perfect because I think many more people can probably resonate with not being able to sing right. than with being rock star singers. Yeah. So, no, that's great, man. Thank you for playing that. Absolutely, um, yeah. That's really cool. Uh, you know, I've got to tell you, I feel compelled to tell you that as, as, you're, as you're playing that, I'm thinking about my buddy, Brother James. Jeremy Rysak is his real name. Brother James is his, is his name that he goes by when you look for him on Spotify. But that's brother with, a, with an A at the end, B-R-O-T-H-A. Uh -huh. All of his songs, you should look them up and everybody listening should look them up. It's their affirmations. All of his songs are positive affirmations. So he has a song called Abracadabra. And it's all about using our words to create positivity in the world, right? And uh, oh, it's really good stuff, man. I think it's good for parents to listen to his songs in the car because, gosh, I, I remember when I was a kid. I'd love to hear what you think about this too, Tim, about lyrics and kids and music. Because mm -hmm. like, I want to be, I want to let my kids listen to whatever, right? Uh huh. I remember growing up and I had a friend whose parents were like, oh, he doesn't let me listen to this music or that music. And I'm like, your parents are lame, <laughs> you know? And, and uh, you know, sometimes I hear music that I listened to when I was a kid. And now my kids are even listening to the same songs. And I'm like, that's terrible. Those lyrics are <laughs> terrible. Holy, you cannot those, listen to that. How did uh, they get on the radio? Dude, I was in the car with my seven-year-old the other day and I was like, oh, this is Eminem, Ocean, check this out. And then I started yeah. listening and I'm like, but I'm turning this off immediately. <laughs> this is terrible. <laughs> oh my god, oh, that's funny. Well, uh, I, I what I do is the big hit that uh, oh, Bruno Mars had a couple years ago. That uh, uh, the Uptown Funk. Yeah, and uh, my kids love that song. But to this day, they think the words are "Hot Man." Can we sing "Hot Man"? Is it a hot damn? You know. <laughs> so we go "Hot Man." <laughs> Dude, that's great. <laughs> so we tweak it to, uh, to let them work. Because if we just sing it hot man loud enough, they won't hear it. <laughs> Dude, what, uh, uh, the funniest video I have is of my one of my best friend's daughters singing that song, doing a dance. And I have, oh, it's such a great video. And she keeps going up. Town, fuck you up. Uptown, <laughs> fuck you up. And dude, he and I are trying our best not to just <laughs> die laughing. But it's not even like a, 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 approximately the word. Like, and she's enunciate like, uptown, fuck 
you out. I mean, she must have been. She's five, got two fingers six. just going. And- I mean, it was hysterical. <laughs> she had no idea what she was saying. Oh, that's hilarious. But, oh, dude, man, that's funny. That, oh. Those are some of my favorite dad moments. <laughs> that's great. Oh, Tim, I also. <laughs> My my son and his best friend, man, they'll they'll we'll drive down the road, and those two in the back of the car, the conversations they have. He's <laughs> he's seven years old. The things they tell each other, it's yeah. hysterical. Like I'm gonna start writing this down about the Ocean uh, and Rozzy show because yeah. I mean they could be their own TV show, dude. Yesterday, Ocean said, uh, Rozzy goes something like. Uh yeah, you, uh, you have more money than I do. Will you buy me this thing? And Ocean's like, I don't have enough money to buy you that, but when I do, I'll buy it for you. And he goes, if my brother dies, I'm going to get all his money and then I'm going to give it... To, like, I mean, dude, the things they say... Oh my God. When my brother dies, I'll get right. all his money. Right. Dude, oh, it's man. just nonstop. Yeah. It's nonstop. It's a, dude, it's what a are, great journey, isn't it? Is the kid? These kids are so amazing. Dude, what are some of the funniest things that you remember that you know about fatherhood so far? Things you've done, things they've done, things that have happy, happened as a family. Like, where what, have you laughed the hardest? Well, gosh, you know, all the time. It's one of those things that we're all like. My son Oliver is the biggest clown, and it drives me insane because I was the the big clown. And so when mm-hmm. two clowns get together, it's kind of like. Oh, he's taking my thunder, you know? It's, so one of us has to be the good cop and one of us has to be the bad cop. <laughs> but they crack each other up so much. As, as having twin boys, I mean, you've got you've got the action right. hero and, and the stunt double where it's always like, you distract them, I'll get the cookies. And there's always something going on where they're out to like knock Hysterical. their teeth out. It's But it's hilarious. Yeah. It's, it's, it's just such a... I had no idea that it would be so much fun having having kids. I honestly don't, I had no idea. My wife wanted kids and I'm like, yeah, that sounds like a good logical step. And now that they're here, I'm like, oh my gosh, this is a 24 seven party. How do you balance the holding the line boundary discipline with being a clown? Right. How do you, how do you navigate that? Well, I, I think, I think intent and understanding a lot of times it's just you just don't, you know, <laughs> you, you try your best and you throw something against the wall and see what sticks. Fair answer. Uh, right now, what we've been doing is the kids are really interested in Harry Potter. And so what we've got on our, our fridge is we've got a little dry erase board and there's three, there's three jars. Each kid has claimed their own house of Hufflepuff or Gryffindor, whatever it is. Right. And so we award house points. And so we, I, I bought, I went on Amazon. I bought this chintzy little $9 trophy that said, Hogwarts cup on it. And I got that. So whoever has the most points gets the Hogwarts cup. Now the cup to you and I mean nothing, but to these guys, it means everything. And so when they find themselves getting a little out of hand, Hey, do I have to take a cup up house point away? And they're like, Whoop. they just, for right now, it works great. Now in two weeks, I'm sure it's all going to come crashing down. But that was something where, Hey, you did really good. You, you opened the door for your sister. You awarded one house point. They're like, go, go write it on the board. I, and so they're so excited. And like I said, these points mean nothing to us, but it's, it's finding something that connects with their hearts and trying to use that to filter what it is you're trying to teach to them. Dude, I love that. That's really cool, <laughs> man. Tim, I knew this was going to be an enjoyable conversation and, and it was. You're really a great dude. And I'm just grateful that we had this opportunity to connect today. Uh, is there anything you wanted to say to the front row dads that we just haven't gotten to? Uh, I think this front row dads thing is without a doubt, one of the coolest things I've accidentally stumbled upon in my life. And so all you guys that are out there doing your best, man, just keep grinding. I am so inspired every single week with what I hear on the podcast. And I learn so much every single week. It's So I just want to say thank you for for providing this for all of us dads out there that are trying to do our best. And we understand that iron sharpens iron. And we need a community to, to get together, to band together, to, to be the right thing for our families. And so I just want to say thank you and, and, and honor you for what you're doing. So thank you for having me. This is fantastic. And I, I appreciate that so much, man. If somebody's in Nebraska, they should hit you up and uh, take some in-person lessons. But <laughs> tell us a little bit about this program that you built for those online anywhere around the world. Tell us about Enjoy Playing Music. Sure. Enjoy Playing Guitar is an online course that is available 
it's centered towards just beginning. So let's say you're, you've always wanted to do it. It's on your bucket list, uh, but you're, you're afraid uh, it's just going to take too much. There's so many different things online. There's, it's a confusing way to get started because there's millions of different courses available. But this course is designed for those who are just ready to, to dive in and it demystifies how to start, right? Because a lot of times we get overwhelmed with too many things, we shut down. What the way I've designed it is it's just, it walks you through just how to get started. So you can kind of do what I did today and maybe I'm not that extreme level, but it helps you overcome kind of those fears and just get you on the path. So it's something I've been working on. It's, it's after teaching probably 37,000 individual one-on-one lessons over the past 15 years, I've distilled it into an easy way to understand it and have fun with it. That's the, that's the whole point of this is enjoy playing guitar because things can get frustrating. So that's my new passion. Yeah. And it's kind of cool to just sit with the idea of how can you enjoy playing dot, 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 right? right. How can you enjoy playing with your kids? How can you yes. enjoy playing with your wife? How can you enjoy playing with your business? And, and uh, I think that it's a beautiful way to a lens in which to view the world. Tim, you have a great energy about your yourself and I'm grateful for the chat. Thanks again for being here, man. I, I look forward to uh, our next exploration of fatherhood, marriage, music, and more. Right on, man. Thanks a lot. Have a good day, Rockstar. Gentlemen, thanks for listening to the show today. Two actions to take from here. First, implement one thing that you learned from the interview. And number two, share this episode with somebody who values being a family man with a business. If you're enjoying the Front Road Ad Podcast, the biggest thanks we ever get are honest reviews. So thank you for your feedback in advance. We read all of them. And if you want to learn more about the Brotherhood, which is our private community of 200 men from six different countries, visit frontroadads.com for more info. If you're wondering what the hell the Brotherhood is all about, I'll leave you with some real feedback from guys who are active members and why they are part of our crew. Thanks again for listening to the show and I'll catch you on the next episode. You have this passion for wanting to find a way to make you a better parent and a better husband, just better in general. And so you develop this community of like-minded men that that aspire to be better and aspire to put family first and business second. And so to me, there's no greater place I'd rather be. You know, people ask me all the time, like if I could only pick one group, mastermind, organization, whatever to be part of besides my own, it's always yours and that's it. And by the way, part of that has to do with you and the leader you are and the way that you treat people and how you show up and the level of preparation that you have and the quality and amount of value that you offer. And then part of it's in the community that's been assembled and these unbelievable like-minded men that show up willing and ready to serve and to give and to share. And so to me, there's no better place that I can be spending my time. I look at two different things that we can be doing with our time. One of them is growing relationships and starting first with the most important relationships. And the other one is growing our financial acumen and and our wealth to be able to do the things that we want to do and have impact and be able to spend time with the people that we value most by buying that time back. So to me, what you do and what I do is a great marriage of what I think is most important. And I would also throw in there that health is, you know, the other component of that. And I feel like the community that you've built, that each of us have built is also centered around that because you talk about being a great husband, parent, that's going to come from taking care of yourself and making sure that you have the energy to be able to serve. And I, I do the same thing on a wealth standpoint, because wealth to me is not just about money. It's actually about having the time and the space to have your personal health. I would take having great health over no money any day of the week, rather than the inverse of that, having a lot of money, but no health. So to me, those are like the three most important components. And to me, we're always merging those three in the things that we each do. And so I think that's why there's a lot of crossover of, you know, members. That's why what you do resonates so much with me. What I do resonates so much with you. I joined as a lifetime member for that small little window where you offered it. I'm like, I'm in because I know if I'm going to commit my time anywhere, this is it because it makes me a better man, makes me a better husband, makes me a better father. It encourages me to really step up my peer group with other like-minded men so that I can be on mission on point with other people that will hold me accountable at the highest level. 
John and I met a year and a half ago at the launch of my first book. And as we were going through the interview, I began to ask him questions about the brotherhood and it resonated within me that a community, a community of like-minded, like-hearted men that wanted to win, as he was just saying, at business and in life. And I'd reverse that. I want to win as a dad. And then I'd also love to be successful in business because I feel like if I, if I don't get the dad right, who cares what I did in business? That's my legacy. That's what lives beyond me. So to tribe up with a bunch of dudes going in the same direction with the pillars that are in place and the the way that not only are you encouraged, compelled, you're chided, you're you know, laughed with, but you get to pace yourself, but you can get around a band of dudes that you can trust, you can share with, you can grow with, and just recently completed a time with these guys. We did us fast at the start of the new year. Every day I would tune in to the little app where we were sharing comments, and I was so impressed how you could see guys that were further down the road and things like this, guys that were just starting, and the camaraderie, the encouragement. So for myself, this was a, a total fit, and I would encourage any dude that's looking for a place where you can feel connected with a band of guys wanting to go in the same direction, Front Row Dads is for you.